Okay, welcome back, everyone. We will continue uh, the end of Acts chapter two. I'm looking at uh, the chat here, and Elisha has asked, "Does verse thirty-eight subset that without baptism one cannot be saved?" Okay. So, uh, Elisha, I think we have talked about this earlier. Uh, though it sounds like that in this passage, we know that that is not uh, what you know the that wouldn't be right to say because nowhere else we see um, you know people being asked to be baptized in order to be saved, but people are told to believe in the lord jesus confess uh, you know that uh, he is lord and that is how they are saved but as an act of their public proclamation of their faith they are asked to be baptized in water so even later we'll see that the apostles are sent to places where people put their faith in jesus and then you know water baptism happens okay so uh, uh, based on verse 38 we should not look at water baptism as a requirement for salvation water baptism is not a requirement but it's an act of obedience after salvation okay i hope it uh, it answers your question uh, elisha yes, yes pastor okay thank great you. thank you thank you uh, yes sir christopher i see your hand raised Uh, Christopher, I can't hear you. Yes, I'm saying something. Can you hear yeah, me? I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, yeah no, I'm just referring to uh, verse 44. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among them, among all, as anyone had need. I just wanted to understand um, are you aware of uh, any churches that operate like this? I mean, how has it worked? And, um, you know, it, it seems to be like a different model. Um, what actually comes to mind also is that maybe in, in, in the current time, you know, a church that operates like this would be considered like a, you know, like a cult um, that, uh, you know, is, is working, uh, doing, working with, the, with people to, you know, to, to um, give up everything. But I guess the, the point I'm making is that uh, Jesus, even when he sent the disciples out, uh, you know, to minister and to preach the word, um he had told them you know don't even take uh you know extra uh you know extra pair of sandals and you know just you know go and you know uh go as you know as completely like you know um people who are who, are, who have no possessions so i just wanted to understand your point your your view on this Okay, so your question is, do I know any churches like this? What I would say is, though it's not a, a, like a typical culture of a church, I do know that uh, there are there are occasions when believers do things like this. And I know personally, I know of times when some believers have had a need and I know of a certain believer who in fact sold what they had uh, to give the others so i i think based on the situation and circumstance this still happens but it's not taken as a general rule because later on you, know, you would see the uh, apostles in fact paul the apostle he writes later uh, uh, about everyone needing to work in order to sustain themselves that he said he says you know don't just be lazy don't be a busybody but you know earn and you sustain yourself and that's the life example that paul gave also because he was a tent maker himself so uh, what is a norm is to be able to take care of yourself and uh, apostle paul also says that one must be able to take care of his immediate family Otherwise, if you don't, if you uh, abandon your immediate family, you're like an unbeliever. Uh, so sustaining oneself, sustaining your immediate family, it's, it's a responsible thing to do. But in the case of, uh, you know, an untoward incident taking place or some calamity or some distress, uh, there is or, or this is applicable, you know, 
people sharing so selflessly with one another i do know that it happens in churches but it is more uh, it, it's not uh, it, how do i put it it's not like the culture that you can observe uh, but it happens right like quietly people do it without making a big noise does does that answer your question christopher um yes i in a way um Okay. So basically, you when you you saying that it's at an individual level or you know maybe a group within mm -hmm. a church. Where I'm coming from is really the church, you know, dictating this or not dictating is not probably not the right word to use, but um, you know, making this as a as a sort of a foundational kind of approach to you know to to share within the community of, of okay. the believers in that particular church. So okay. yeah. Okay, so uh, so Christopher, see the thing is, if we make it a rule or if we make it mandatory that people have to even sell their own possessions to give into other people's lives, uh, it's it it'll it can be dangerous because one is we're imposing it on everyone. So when need arises, if you know it warrants for someone to sell and give well and good uh, but otherwise what i what i feel is happening these days is the church of jerusalem in in uh, we'll see later even in acts chapter 3 we'll see it was not well to do it was if you want to call it poor so they had to sell in order to give but these days when we want to give we may not need to sell we can give of what we have you know what i mean so that also is actually happening. People give from what they have. So you don't have to go to the extent of selling. OK, great. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Charles, uh, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Pastor, for the, for the opportunity. I am continuing with Elisha's question about water baptism. When you read from the book of John, chapter 3 verse 5 uh, Jesus answered truly truly I say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God and now you said that the water baptism is not a requirement so what was Jesus meaning with water and spirit to see the kingdom of God thank you mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, um, Charles. So, see, Charles, we have to interpret scripture based on scripture. Okay, so here, verse 38, it appears as if water baptism is a prerequisite or a requirement for salvation. But we know from other clear passages in scripture that when one believes in their heart and confesses the Lord Jesus, they are saved. It's a work of the Spirit. But we affirm that work through our act of obedience, which is what? baptism now coming back to john chapter 3 and verse 5 where jesus says that you know one should be born uh, of water and of the spirit see what he was talking about was two births one is the natural birth the other is the spiritual birth so waters of birth is how uh, you know we we refer to the you know those of us who know how exactly birth takes place the water breaks and the child comes out so those are the waters that john is talking about so he says one should be born of water is the water of birth it's not the water of baptism john's baptism at that time no that's that's not what he's uh, referring to at all and in fact uh yeah anyway i'll leave it at that so it simply means the waters of birth which is your first birth and then you have to be born of the spirit which is your second spiritual birth or being born again so does that help charles okay i did hear you but i saw your uh, <coughs> mic unmuted so yes uh, shri kumar please go ahead yeah thank you pastor i just want to um uh... No, it is connected with uh, Brother Christopher's uh, question. So maybe um, I just fell to something as he was asking that, uh, you know, Jesus uh, said this thing that uh, you should take, you know, in the Luke chapter 22, 35, 
that uh, you know he says that um, he uh, gives this instruction to the disciples not to take the purse and other thing but um, even in the if you read uh, you know 35 and 36 um, it was a, it was as you said it's a, like nowadays we are not uh, you know we are not supposed to sell the things and and i agree with that and when jesus said those things here it very clearly says that in the 35th word uh, luke 22 35 and he said unto them when i sent you without purse and the script and the shoes lacked you anything and they said nothing and then 36 words he says and then he said unto them but now he hath purse let him take it and likewise the script and he hath no sword let him sell his garments and buy one so it means that it was on occasion to occasion when god actually led the people and um, it, it cannot be a doctrine i just wanted to say that thank you Pastor. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sri Kumar. So that added more clarity to the discussion. Uh, so yes, we must not make this uh, doctrine and mandatory and say, you know, if the church is not this generous, that people go to the extent of selling their possessions and goods, you're not a giving church. That's not true. And moreover, uh, this concept, you know, of, of giving to other believers can be abused. Uh, sorry to put it uh, very plainly, it can be. So uh, we we must not make it mandatory. Uh, but yes, of course, we will we will promote a culture of sharing and loving and uh, upholding one another. And uh, as and when required, if something like this needs to be done for people to even sell their own things and give to others uh, it can be done under the guidance of the leadership okay all right oh okay yes sister uh, you have a question Rupa. ma'am shall i add uh, yes, two points to what has been being asked first thing yeah. about this community which started sharing all that they had they sold and kept it the um Apostles' feet. Nobody has asked him to do that. It was initiated by the Spirit of God in their hearts and they obeyed the Spirit's guidance. You never see any apostles saying, please sell everything and bring them and put them at our feet. That is the first point I wanted to say. And the other thing, even now, there's a, there are certain communities in the world which live by this principle, Acts 2 principle. And it is working out. And also, as believers, we have to love the people more than the uh, whatever material things God has given us. So it is a, sometimes God may test us by asking us. No one can. Paul has clearly told in Corinthians, please, you do, no one should uh, give uh, because somebody is forcing them but they should give with their complete heart. And David also says, this heart is given by God. It is not something we put on. This is a heart which we give completely unto the Lord, which is given by the Lord. It's a great blessing. So I just wanted to add, nobody has forced them to give, sell their positions and give. Out of the love of God, when they saw the people, the body of Christ in pain, in need, they sold everything and put it the apostles feet and it was written there and they lacked nothing they were all happy thank you ma'am i just wanted to add yeah thank you thank you so much sister rupa makes complete sense so it was voluntary and of course it was temporary what we saw here uh, and uh, you know praise god uh, that the love of christ was seen you know, in, in what the Holy Spirit was doing in that community at this time. Uh, and, you know, we recognize that. Okay. Uh, so, yes, we will. Uh, Kennedy has something to share. Kennedy. Yes, please. Just to add up on what my dear sister Rupa said. I think they did it out of compassion. The way Christ was very compassionate with us. So it's just a demonstration of how the whole, their lives were being transformed. Thank you. Yeah, 
so true so they did it out of compassion they did it because their lives were transformed that also uh, goes to show us the power of the gospel how the gospel changed the people to such an extent that they were um, willing you know to to love and give selflessly and to such a you know great great uh, uh, amount that they were willing to give to one another so yes uh, so very beautiful isn't it so we see the birth of the church we see the empowering of the holy spirit we see the um, the boldness uh, through the holy spirit we see the wisdom of the holy spirit we also see the manifestation of the spirit in the community so there is unity there is commitment to the word of god there is commitment to uh, the uh, remembrance of what the lord jesus did there is commitment to uh, pray there is commitment uh, there is also the manifestation of the supernatural there is a good reputation that the believers have among all the people they the believers are honored the apostles are honored so all this is only possible as a work of god and uh, it's very evident on the day of pentecost it's very evident in the first believing community so verse 46 it says so continuing daily with one accord again you know unity there is unity among the people uh, how often did they meet now again these are all questions which people ask and they want to impose the same pattern on our communities today it may work it may not work okay we have to really tailor the the way we uh, uh, plan for our you know believing community or church as per uh, our times so here daily they met it says continue continuing daily so they met daily and uh, it says one accord in the temple so they ha had a heart of unity but even phys in um, practice as a gathering they met daily they met in the temple uh, and breaking bread from house to house so they practiced communion in their small groups if, if you want to call it you know their their house groups uh, and they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart so such was their coming together verse 47 praising god and having favor with all people and the lord added to the church daily those who were being saved so uh since then since the time of um the day of pentecost every day you know these people are practicing their faith they are standing strong in their faith and what happens when believers are like this daily new people are being added so it's a glorious time we we would desire to be in a time like this where every day people are being saved through the gospel of the lord jesus christ so uh sister rupa i can see your hand raised is this uh, uh the previous comment or do you have something new to share ma'am i have I forgot, but one point I would like to add. Yeah. One, um, every day they used to gather, and that way, most of them, there were proselytes coming from different parts of the world during Pentecost. I, it is somewhere I have read, and they were all through this first church by uh, meeting together every day. They were nurtured and discipled before they went back into their own countries. So I just wanted to add that, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So that's also powerful uh, that people who were people who were saved were discipled. They were equipped to go out and do God's work in their time. So uh, we we don't read about you know people going out, but that's a fact. Th those who came in and who were saved, some of them went back to their places but some of them stayed on and that's how that's what we refer to as the church of jerusalem so there was a gathering in jerusalem that continued and that became the um, you know the uh, representatives of god in that city so 
so far we have seen the birth of the church we've seen the birth of a, uh, a loving and a powerful community now let's move on to acts chapter 3 and see what is happening over here okay are you all with me so far it's going okay yes okay nice so only one person <laughs> is uh, fine with Okay, all right. Yeah, I have some more responses here. Asha, Kung. Okay, all right. Christopher, Pratik, Abhishek. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, good that you know you are in sync. So Acts chapter 3. It says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Okay, so what does this tell us? This tells us that the apostles continued in their Jewish tradition, some of their traditions, the good ones. What are some of the good ones? Prayer. Even Jesus had his times of prayer. So the Jews had, you know, uh, certain periods of uh, the day, and they would go to the temple and worship. So that's what Peter and John are doing here. Peter and John are uh, apostles. So you will also begin to see the leadership in the church, you know, uh, kind of evolve. So we only heard Peter's name in Acts chapter 2. Even in Acts chapter 1, end of that passage, it was Peter. Now it is Peter and John. Okay, Peter and John, they went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So, you know, somewhere around afternoon time, like 3 p.m. Is, is when they had gone there. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. Okay. So here was a person. What is the description of this person? He was lame from birth. So it says, lame from his mother's womb. Because he was lame, he was carried. And he was laid, how often? Daily at the gate of the temple, which is called as beautiful. Okay, let me quickly show you a picture. Yes, Kum? By mistake, okay. All right. I'm showing you not quickly, though. <laughs> There's just some navigation issues there. But I hope you can see this. Are you able to see uh, class? Okay, nice. So, yeah, here you are. You can observe. So, this is the temple. And they go into the temple, and there are different sections of the temple here. Uh, this is on the Temple Mount. Uh, and a particular gate is called as the Gate Beautiful. And this is where you, know, you would have uh, people begging for alms seated. Uh, the next section here is called as Solomon's Porch. So uh, during prayer times, you would have this entire space you know it will be filled with uh, lots of people coming in for their routine prayer okay so this is how it is so you have the beautiful gate beautiful uh, and then you have a solomon's porch over here so why is this place termed as gate beautiful okay so it was obviously um a huge gate uh, it was it had some incredible artwork on it uh, they had they had put some silver and gold and ma made it a grand gate so uh, that is the reason it's known as the gate beautiful or the beautiful gate because it it had uh, you know nice art on it and silver and gold uh, sort of you know covering the surface so at this gate Obviously, people would notice beggars sitting there as they went for worship. So along with the, the beggars, other beggars, is there, is, there, is there this lame person who's lame from his birth? Okay, then what happens next? 
so called beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple so this was his regular practice and jews being um, you know generous as they were and going by um, you know their culture they would give something to these beggars verse 3 who seeing peter and john about to go into the temple asked for alms so he saw these two men he had no idea who peter is who john is as you know, he just thought, okay, some uh, two men are going, let me ask them for help. So what kind of help will a beggar need? He is not able to work for himself. So his minimal expectation would be some money. His minimal expectation would be you know, some food. That will help me sustain myself. So that's all he was looking for. If he got anything more than that, you know, he would have been blessed. So with that expectation, he reached out to Peter and John. So he, okay, where are we? Verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for arms. Verse 4, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said. So now the beggar is asking and both John and Peter are looking at the beggar. They're giving the beggar the attention. And they ask for his attention. So in verse 4, they say, look at us. So now what will happen to a beggar, a poor beggar? His expectation will rise. Why are these people asking me to look at them? Maybe they want to give me more money. or Maybe they want to invite me home. Maybe there is something more you know, that is coming my way. So his expectation rises. And verse 5. So. He gave them his attention. So the beggar looks back at Peter and John, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Okay. So the first part of what Peter says is quite disappointing because that's the expectation of the beggar to get some money at least. And Peter says, silver and gold I don't have. And as I told you, the early church, you know, as an organization, as a, an institution, you know, they were not rich. You know, they, they were probably a few weeks you know, into the, the life of the church. And they don't have uh, big resources. If you compare them to the established uh, Jewish society there and the you know, Jewish relig religion and what they possessed, Peter and John as a community had nothing. So they were honest with the beggar. They say, look, we are at Gate Beautiful. You see all the, the gold and silver, but this is the reality. Silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I give you. What they had was actually better than these earthly resources. And that was you know, the power and the authority of the name of Jesus, which they carried and they used it. So what do they say? They say, in the, or Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So he gave of that authority he gave of that faith in the name of jesus and he commands this man to rise up and walk now think together with me this man has not walked since birth how can someone have the courage to say in the name of jesus christ of nazareth rise up and walk by the Holy Spirit. And also, you know, when we read about the gifts of the Spirit, there is something, one of the gifts, uh, we it's the gift of faith. Okay, So we see there that unusual faith arises in us by the Holy Spirit when we can expect God to do things that cannot be done otherwise. So that gift of faith was operational in Peter. No wonder he talks to a man like this and he tells him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. See the boldness again? Introducing the exact person who was controversial up until that point. He says, Jesus, 
his calling in Christ, which in itself is a big thing, and he makes it more specific of Nazareth in the name of this person because he's the Messiah, rise up and walk. So he issues a command in the name of Jesus. Verse 7, and then what does he do? He's continuing to operate in that gift of faith. Verse 7, and he took him by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankles, ankle bones receive strength. Wow, that's a miracle. Peter just gave some support. And scriptures tell us immediately his feet, his ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up and stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. Wow, that is amazing. Somebody who has, who was carried, you know, at that point to sit at the gate is now what? He is leaping. He stood up. He walked, entered the temple with them. Again, it says walking, leaping and praising God. So a supernatural work of God was done in the sight of all the people. Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Wow, it would have been, you know, unbelievable for them to see this man. And it says daily. So these people must have seen him for weeks. <clears throat> if not, you know, they, they probably would have even seen him for months or years. And here he is finally walking and praising God. So a great work of wonder was done in the midst of the people on that day through Peter and John. Verse 10. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now we, uh, I know that your batch has completed that uh, course called the Keys to Supernatural Ministry. And why is the supernatural important? You see here, one is it expressed the compassion of God for that lame man. But at the same time, what's happening? It draws the attention of the people. So the people saw him walking and praising God. And then what? You know, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And so they were interested in this God and what he can do. So uh, let me just come back here and look at the chat. Okay, so Elisha says, there is indeed power in the name of Jesus. Uh, say, is that a comment or a question that you have? An observation or more like a comment. Sh should I wait or? Sure, I sure. Think... Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, I just, I, I just, I, I just wanted to um, comment based on what you said so that I think it's something that we should not miss because um, in the church circle, somehow, somehow, People have just have used um, Peter's statement as a justification for remaining broke or just encouraging poverty, you know. And I like the context you brought in. Um, they had left fishing. Church has just started, you know. They weren't doing anything much. So they didn't have much per se, you know. So when he was saying it, he wasn't saying it as a justification that, oh, as Christians, we can't have, uh, we can't um, have money, we can't have savings, you know, and all that. It was just basically because at that moment, you know, they were not just really uh, financially buoyant at that moment. So it wasn't a justification that, oh, you can be highly anointed and you don't need to have material wealth and all that, you know, and all that and all that. So I, I think it's a very good observation you just brought up. And I, I just wanted to buttress that again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Say. Uh, glad that you observed that. Um, uh, and, you know, it is said uh, that the statement Peter made was a good statement when he said, silver and gold, I do not have, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, what if he said, silver and gold I have, but I don't have anything else to give you. And he couldn't demonstrate the power of God. 
right so having wealth not having wealth you know that is one part of it and as you rightly pointed out we are uh, we need to be good stewards of the resources that god gives us and even as a community or a church family we can um, you know grow in these things and uh, develop ourselves that would be good that would be ideal but the other side of it is we have to grow in the anointing and the power of god and we should always be able to tell people who come to us in the name of what i do have i give i do have the authority i do have the anointing and in the name of jesus christ of nazareth rise up and walk you know that second part should never be taken you know away from the church if we are a church who cannot say that and we have silver and gold doesn't make any sense okay there's no meaning to a church like that that has the resources but does not is not able to exercise its authority in the name of jesus okay so just uh, adding to our our discussion here and elisha um says in verse 7 peter helped the lame man to rise any lesson in that for us okay so the lesson is when the uh, the gift of faith you know takes over uh, we do as we are led by the holy spirit can i imitate what peter did you know can i go and uh, uh, help a, a person who has never walked you know help him rise up and say you try to walk now well nothing wrong with it but let me it it's important for me to be led by the holy spirit you know i cannot copy uh, these styles of ministering as a formula it will never work sometimes even in the ministry of jesus we see he spoke a word and people were healed he said stretch out your hand the the leper was healed he went and touched somebody they were healed he rebuked the fever the fever left so he was doing different things as led by the holy spirit so there is no formula elisha so though we observe peter helping the lame man rise up uh yeah it's it's just the way peter did it so i i can't say that we can follow what peter did every time and this we are led by the holy spirit okay so uh, i hope that answers your question christopher uh, please go ahead you have you have something to say yeah just two observations um one is with regards to this uh, you know this um, topic about um, you know i guess poverty and uh, you know not having not having the means to uh, you know have uh, income um again i think i'm not i, I mean i'm not trying to point out uh, something that possibly is obvious but there are denominational churches that are uh, that take a vow of poverty that means they don't earn any money for any services they provide they they provide or even uh, you know uh, they, they they're not they should not be taking any money you know in the case of a someone uh, now a, a relative of theirs who is you know build some money to them they will not uh, they will not take that money uh, but on the other hand um uh, there are churches obviously denominational churches that are that over the years are are, are rich and um, able to you know sustain um uh, and take care of of the of the of the of the priests in that in that ministry or in that church so uh, i mean this is just an observation maybe uh, you know that, that may, maybe you have a view on that the other point is actually uh, with regards to the miracles that uh, that were performed by the apostle, uh, apostles and even later where um i'm not sure about this but i don't know i don't think that they even you know spoke to the people who had who they had healed uh to tell them that uh they should not you know um talk about it and uh versus jesus i mean during his time uh, there were numerous uh you know occasions where he he mentioned that you know he uh you know don't don't uh you know don't talk about it don't uh, mention about it so i just wanted to get your view on on that part um, on you know the difference uh in in uh in how this was uh communicate uh what this was minister uh not minister but how this was actually done uh you know during jesus by jesus and subsequently after after uh, afterwards by the apostles and later 
Yeah. Sure, 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 Christopher. Yes. So uh, your first uh, observation about the vow of poverty, we don't see any such vow in scripture. Uh, uh, we, yeah, we do know that, you know, there were occasions when Jesus said, okay, don't take uh, a lot with you. You just go with what you have. But that is not to say that, you know, you can never earn in your life or, uh, or uh, that you, you uh, don't receive uh, money from anybody. So that, that was not the point that Jesus was making. It was about depending on him uh, in that particular scenario. So this vow of poverty for an entire lifetime, uh, I mean, I don't know. It, I, I don't see any basis in scripture for it. But if people are led to do something like that, it's their own call. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and yes, of course, you know, uh, the uh, when people do take such a call, they sometimes are part of institutions uh, that can sustain them, right? So technically, they're not receiving an income for their services, but they still have the bare minimum taken care of by an organization or something. Uh, organization so yeah we we observe all this uh, around us and uh, yeah i don't know what we can take from it but yeah there is no scriptural basis to that as far as i'm concerned a vow of poverty okay uh, the next thing that you said is uh, christopher could you please come again you said miracles no, I was just saying that Jesus uh, performed oh, yeah. miracles. I remember. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So, uh, in the case of Jesus, there was, you know, something of an uprising starting off where people were already opposing him, questioning him. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were um, uh, greatly troubled by Jesus and his ministry. So, Jesus was just trying to be wise. And not, you know, create more trouble for himself, which is why quite often he used to tell the people, okay, keep it to yourself, just go report it to, uh, you know, the, the temple priest, but don't go and spread the word because it would become very difficult for him to minister in that space. So that was his uh, intention. However, when we look at, uh, you know, something like uh, Peter and John ministering to the lame man here, they are not worried about. Uh, you know, being caught and all of that. So uh, the the context is different in that sense. Uh, is, is that okay, Christopher? Yes, I mean, I I think uh, I mean may not, may not be there in the Bible, but there may may have been times I think that possibly even you know the apostles, uh, you know, did the same thing because I mean the 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 uprising and um, the, um, the the sort of uh, Protests that were that uh, that were there uh, during um, you know the time when uh, the apostles actually uh, uh, performed these miracles. I, I think it was also there. You know, I mean, and they were they were threatened. They were put in jail, and uh, so um, again, I, I I just I just wanted to get, get some clarity on. Sure. On, on sure. See, another reason why I um, compared it in that way is you we'll see later. In, Coming up in Acts chapter 4, when these people are threatened, they actually pray and ask God to help them do more in the name of Jesus. Let more miracles take place. Let more signs and wonders take place. So, you know, they, uh, you, you somehow see them going very boldly and uh, continuing the works of God as opposed to, yes, Jesus was also doing it, but he did instruct people not to go and spread the word uh, just to you you could say delay what was to happen to him you know as a, a trial and all that so anyway we'll we'll leave that discussion there uh, i'll come to kennedy yes kennedy thank you thank you for giving me this chance again well what i'm like to ask how would you compare this beggar in the case of peter and john in relation to these people who preach prosperity gospel Okay, uh, how would I, how would I compare? Yeah, because there are these people who, who preach prosperity gospel. See, uh, how would I compare is, 
whenever we use the term prosperity gospel we we call it prosperity gospel because it's kind of uh, extreme it does the word of god say he will bless us he will bless us financially he'll prosper us yes he does okay so being blessed is part of the gospel but when it is taken to an extreme that is prosperity gospel uh, so one thing that we can say from what peter and john did is yes even if you don't have resources when you walk by faith uh, in in god mighty things can be accomplished for the kingdom of god so uh, in that sense you know it it is different from the prosperity gospel because the prosperity gospel would uh, say no you need to have so you know you claim it you name it you claim it uh, and god will make you rich stuff like that but whether or not you're rich you can still flow uh, in in the anointing and uh, in faith that's what peter and john are teaching us through their example Okay, so I I hope that would answer uh, your question, Kennedy. Does it make sense? Yes, no, yes, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So maybe I just initiated the answer, and uh, you know, because that's the me. way the brother say. Brother say said they use that one to people to be poor. You know, as mm. church leader, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be poor. But when you hear the prosperity gospel, where you you can claim anything by faith and get it, it mm. does it contradict? Yeah, so both are extremes, no, Kennedy. That's what I'm saying. There is a balance in God's word. So prosperity gospel. I don't know if there's a term called poverty gospel, but you know both are extremes: poverty gospel, prosperity gospel. We are in between. We have the balance of you know living a responsible life, being accountable. being good stewards and being blessed being prosperous so we'll stop here and we'll continue in the next class uh, let me just pray and close for today heavenly father we thank and praise you for uh, lord your presence with us and lord thank you lord for giving us the understanding uh, today lord as as we went over uh, the book of acts father we pray that you will continue to strengthen us uh, lord and help us learn many things that we would can live for you lord the way people lived in uh, the acts of the apostles father god thank you once again lord for this time in jesus name we pray amen thank you everybody and uh, bye for amen. now thank you thank you ma'am thank you we'll connect in the next class thank you bye